Hello and welcome to Information Retrieval. Today, we'll take a look at probabilistic retrieval. So before we jump into probabilistic retrieval, I'll try to revise uh, some fundamental concepts. There's a nice story from the world of uh, mathematics, volume four, where um, in New York in late 1940s, uh, a bridge gets suddenly crowded. It seems like everyone is going to Long Island uh, that day uh, crossing that bridge. People are surprised. The ones who are driving are also surprised. The uh, the toll booth operators are surprised. The, uh, the, the police officers who are on uh, surveillance are also surprised. So they ask each other, what's going on? Why are you going? And usually the other party would ask back the same question, what's happening? Why everyone is going today to that side? Is there something happening on that side? So this is just a, a funny story to illustrate uh, the concepts that um, when normalcies don't exist, when we start deviating from what is normal, um, things may go haywire. And that kind of uh, life will be unlivable. So if normal things stop happening, if we lose regularities in life, our planet could become unlivable. So that's true, isn't it? Well, the story goes on uh, interestingly. Uh, it says uh, Congress had to be called uh, to take action. They had to pass, uh, pass laws uh, to control uh, the irregularities uh, or to stop these kind of irregularities from happening in uh, future. So this is just to introduce you to the uh, idea of the law of large numbers or known as the fundamental theorem of probability. It treats as the average of the results obtained from a large number of trials should be close to the expected value and will tend to become closer uh, as more trials are performed. In other words, um, if on a normal day you expect uh, a traffic of some volume to cross the bridge and as long as we uh, are slightly off here or there, it's fine, but if you keep uh, looking at it every day, you would see that uh, the sum of vehicles that uh, move through uh, in a period of time um, would uh, tend to approach to an expected value. Here is an example, a simple textbook example. Let's roll a die and assume uh, you may see 1 to 6 with uh, equal probabilities. Um, so if you keep uh, adding up the phase of the die that you see on every roll um, what, and, and keep averaging it, what do you think should be the expected value over a long number of uh, trials? Well, it uh, it should approach 3.5 as per the law of large numbers. So I repeat, according to a law of large numbers, uh, if a large number of six-sided dice are rolled or if a six-sided die is rolled large number of times, the average of their values, uh, sometimes also called the sample mean, is likely to be close to 3.5 with the precision increasing as more dice are rolled. Uh, just like the fundamental theorem of uh, probability, we also have fundamental theorem of algebra. Uh, do you think you can recollect? Take a minute. Loosely speaking, it is every polynomial has roots uh, and more precisely, every non-constant single variable polynomial with complex coefficients has at least one complex root. We'll not get into this uh, for this lecture, but I just wanted to highlight that there are these fundamental theorems, uh, uh, many of them, and uh, these are really, really interesting and, and I urge you to go and study them if you haven't uh, come across uh, already. Okay, now let's jump into conditional probability. So let's say the probability of an event A happening is 0.52 and the probability of uh, event B1 happening is uh, 0.1 uh, and so on as given in this Euler diagram. So I have uh, event A, B1, B2 and B3 happening with some probabilities given inside those circles. And now if I take the universe uh, of all these uh, events and uh, events which are out of a b1 b2 and b3 um, then i can repre represent all these probabilities using this euler diagram so let's say i tell you that b1 happened uh, so given that b1 happened what is the probability of a or in other words what is the conditional probability that uh, uh, probability of a given b1 
take a minute pause the video here and uh, compute it yourself well uh, in this case uh, the probability of a is 1 because uh, b1 is subsumed inside a okay what is the probability of a happened uh, given b2 happened now note that it's possible that uh, b2 happened and a happened and it's also possible that b2 happened but a did not happen and that's because uh, there is an overlap of a with b2 but not all of b2 is subsumed within a and from the diagram you can uh, you can say that uh, it's the, the part that intersects a and b2 is 0.12 and the one that is outside is 0 0.04 Again, I'll uh, let you do this computation. Um, if you don't understand this, uh, I urge you to go back to conditional probability uh, and, uh, and, and uh, make yourself comfortable with this idea. So this is essential for uh, the rest of the lecture today. Okay, uh, let's revisit uh, uh, probability. So developers in two companies let's say are distributed as follows uh, they compute uh, joint probabilities uh, as follows so let's say uh, i mean so sorry uh, so developers in two companies are distributed as follows and we are required to compute the joint uh, probabilities okay so let's say there are two companies company x and company y and there are java developers and c, c developers so if I tell you that there is one Java developer in company X, 17 Java developers, 17 C developers in company X, uh, and uh, similarly 37 Java developers in company Y and 20 C developers in company Y. You can of course tell me there are on, uh, on the whole there are 38 Java developers and 37 C developers and I could take uh, marginal sums on this side as well. So there are 18 uh, company X employees and there are 57 company Y employees and so on. So this is uh, given to you. Now uh, we want to compute the joint probabilities, right? So, uh, so the probability uh, of company X and Java, right? So if I pick one employee, uh, what is the probability that he belongs to company X and he is also a Java programmer? So the joint probability of company X and Java seems to be one out of the whole population, which is 75. So one out of 75, that gives us 0 0.013 so these concepts uh, are uh, basic foundation stone uh, we are going to apply these on uh, on information retrieval okay uh, so that was uh, the joint probability uh, we could also compute probability of uh, someone being an employee at company Y and practicing Java and that should come to 0 0.493, 37 by 75. Uh, um, so, um, sometimes we write joint properties as probability of AB or probability of A intersection B or probability of A and B. Okay. Um, now let's jump to conditional probability. What do you think is the conditional probability of um, no? So if I tell you that this person is a Java a Java developer, what is the probability that he belongs to company Y? In other words, probability of company Y given Java is how much? Also, do you think uh, probability of company Y given Java is same as probability of Java given company Y? Again, brush your conditional probability concepts. Take a minute, pause your video here and work this out. Okay, so it turns out uh, that these conditional probabilities are not the same. So probability that, um, so if I tell you that he's a Java developer, there are only 38 Java developers. And out of those 38 Java developers, uh, probability of someone belonging to company Y is 37 out of 38, which is obvious from these numbers. But if I tell you someone belongs to company Y, then there are only 37 employees. And out of them, uh, if, if we need to figure out the probability of him doing Java, 
then uh, okay we have 57 employees sorry in company y and out of them uh, people doing java is 37 so it's 37 out of 57 uh, and we get 0.649 so these numbers are not the same okay so probability of a given b is not the same as probability of b given a i also want to refresh one other concept before we move on and that's of odds uh, odds of something happening and probability of something happening are very different things um, so the odds of an event a happening is probability of the event a happening over the probability of a not happening okay or probability of anything else apart from a happening um, so which is given as a probability of a over one minus uh, probability of a this a should be in uh, uh, brackets uh, Sorry about that. I'll fix the slides. Okay. So one more exercise for you to uh, work out. Uh, what is the probability of getting a five when rolling a six-sided die? Assume it's a fair die. Uh, so this must be fairly straightforward. Um, so there is one face which has five out of the six faces. And what is the probability of getting it? So one out of six, right? Uh, but what is the odds of getting the uh, same event? Um, so all of the odds of getting the same event is probability of getting a 5 over probability of not getting a 5 that's uh, 1 over 6 divided by uh, 1 minus uh, 1 over 6 right so many times um, the universe is um, huge uh, that uh, computing them might be a problem uh, so we <coughs> we um, revert to using odds which is much more convenient you'll see why uh, in the rest of the lecture uh, so here i go back to the original example of probability of a given uh, b2 happening and uh, probability of a given b2 is if you work out all these probabilities you should uh, reach uh, at 0.75 um, at, at point uh, yeah seven five okay um, let's uh, let's get to uh, the odds uh, in some time I suggest uh, these uh, interesting reads for you uh, probability and computing by uh, Hoopful and uh, Mitchell Maker uh, and fooled by randomness uh, fooled by randomness is a, a non mathematical uh, book it's it's more like a novel uh, from the financial expert uh, uh, Nicholas Taleb um, uh, these are pretty interesting and it motivates one to pursue probability all right um, without further ado let's uh, get started but I also want to uh, refresh your memories on one other topic before jumping into uh, the actual probabilistic retrieval under so that's Bayesian uh, data analysis and uh, beta distribution uh, today, my objective is not to get into the details, definition, formalisms, derivations, and proofs. We'll keep that for, uh, for another day. Uh, but rather, we, I want to get into concepts, illustrations, intuitions, purposes, and properties, which will allow you to understand the whole models that we would like to uh, derive for uh, retrieval. Okay, so we start with this basic idea of coin flips. Right. So the general assumption here is that if a coin is fair, then heads and tails are equally likely. But the coin need not be fair. So we don't take, we, we do not follow the general assumption that the coin needs to be fair. Okay. So let's say um, I have two coins, coin one and coin two, and I flip um, coin one 10 times and I got this series, triple H, triple T, HT, HT. I flip coin 2 and I get uh, the other series which is 9 times h head and 1 times t. Now which coin do you think is more fair compared to one another? Most people tell me if I mean if you have to make your decision only based on the data uh, most people would uh, tell me that coin 1 is more likely to be fair because it has good balance of heads and tails whereas coin 2 seems to be skewed towards it maybe it's a rare 
there is a rare possibility of uh, getting a tail but uh, it looks like uh, the head side is far heavier and keep getting uh, heads or i think it's the other way around the heavier side so when you toss a coin i believe the heavier side goes down and the lighter side stays up um, uh, so maybe head is the lighter side anyways uh, let's not get into the physics of it uh, mathematically or probabilistically arguing uh, it seems like this coin the second coin seems to be skewed a little um, we need uh, some structured way or a systematic way to make these kind of arguments. So can we build one uh, structured way? That's the whole point here. So let's say we make a table uh, and as we make observations, we make some beliefs. So initially, we'll assume that the coin is fair to start with because we have not seen any tosses of the coin. Now let's toss this coin, coin one, and let's say I get a head. The moment I get a head, I convince myself that, oh, this coin is a skewed coin. And now when I toss again, I observe that, let's say I get a tail. Then I change my belief and I come back to the original belief that, no, this is a fair coin because I've seen one head and one tail. So, so I've seen equal number of head and tail so far. So it's a fair coin. Then I, uh, I toss it again. So now I get a head again. Uh, now when I get a head again, I again go back to the belief that, oh, this is skewed. And then I toss again, I get a tail. Now again come back to the belief that uh, it is fair. So these are called belief updates. So we keep tossing, observe the data and update our beliefs. Let's try to do the same thing with coin2. When I do this with the coin2, uh, I again start with uh, the observation or the belief that um, uh, it's fair and I toss it once I get a head I believe it's skewed. I toss it again I get another head and I this time believe it's more skewed and I toss it one more time and again get a head and now I believe it's even more skewed and I keep updating my beliefs like this. Now after getting four heads if I get a tail um, I'm not going to believe that it is fair but rather I'm going to only believe that it is less skewed than the fourth attempt uh, when I was uh, tossing for a head. Right. Uh, so this is uh, the way I update my beliefs. So there are two things to note over here. Um, we have a prior belief to start with about a coin. This need not always be fair. I took an example here uh, uh, for this illustration. I assume that the initial belief is fair, but the prior belief or the initial belief may be anything. And then we keep doing belief updates. Okay, just to illustrate the uh, a little more on the uh, prior belief, uh, consider this case. Um, some priors can be very strong and some priors can be very weak. Um, uh, a weak prior uh, usually happens with, the, uh, with, with an unseen uh, data. Like let's say I have a new coin and I have never seen any observations before or I've seen very few observations, then uh, the, the coin has a weak prior. And what does that mean? Uh, if I have a weak prior, it means that uh, uh, there are very few observations that I need to change my belief. But a coin may also have a strong prior, which let's say there is a coin which is lab tested for 1 million tosses and someone certifies it saying in a 1 million toss uh, experiment, 50% uh, heads and 50% tails were observed. And now this coin is given to you. Now you, you toss it once more. When you toss it once more, irrespective of whether you get a head or tail, your belief will not get, um, will not move too much, right? Because uh, the prior is way too strong. So this is what we, um, uh, when, so when I say a weak prior or a strong prior, this is what I mean. The prior probability of uh, heads uh, could be anything. Um, it's 0 0.5, let's say if it's a fair coin, um, it, uh, if it is skewed towards tail, it's 0 0.25. Uh, so I, I am assigning some kind of objective value uh, towards the skewness, for the skewness. Okay? I call this as the hyperparameter. So let us say for our discussion that uh, if the value, if the hyperparameter is zero, uh, both the sides of the coin has only tails, or in other words, it's a one-sided coin. Um, and one indicates that head is guaranteed all the time and different values in between uh, 0 and 1. So let's call this a hyperparameter theta. Uh, 
uh, uh, let's call theta as the hyperparameter to visualize what happens for different values. Okay, so let's chart the probability p of uh, theta. Um, I welcome you to the world of distributions. So discrete distributions um, uh, is what we are now looking at. Uh, since I typically perceive coins as fair, the prior belief uh, peaks at 0.5, right? So p of theta is the prior belief of the coin. Uh, the prior belief of the uh, coin peaks at, uh, you see, 0.5. Uh, so we start with an assumption that it's a fair coin. Um, P of theta could also be a uniform distribution, which simply says that uh, my, uh, I mean, I know nothing about the theta, right? So any value of theta is equally likely. So this is, uh, this is what happens when you have a very weak prior yeah so any so any value of theta is likely so p of theta is a uniform distribution so let's flip the coin five times and let's say we observed three heads right so suddenly my uniform distribution gets pulled towards uh, one side uh, because now uh, the nature of the coin which is indicated by uh, theta um, you know it, it goes towards 0.6 um, so, so out of uh, uh, out of n equals five, uh, that is five observations. Z equals three, which is I found three heads. So, so my uh, coin seems to be slightly skewed towards uh, the head. So, let's call this value probability of seeing this data given the nature of the coin, this uh, particular theta, right? So now this is a distribution for different kinds of theta. I'm going to get different kinds of probability of d given theta. So we call this probability of d given theta as the likelihood. Uh, notice that it uh, it is very intuitive here because uh, the likelihood of being uh, the coin uh, being head heavy is more in this case, right, than being tail heavy because we have seen three we have seen three heads in five coin tosses. Okay. Um, Another point that you should note here is that beliefs and observations are not the same. Belief is different. So belief is what you update after you see the observations, right? And this is where Bayes rule comes very handy. So what does Bayes rule say? So the probability of the nature of the coin given the data that you have observed, right? So if you are given some data, five coin tosses and three heads you found, so that kind of a data, then the nature of the coin is a distribution right so it's very likely that the coin you cannot say with certainty the coin is this you can only say uh, that okay it's very likely that the coin is skewed towards this but it's also possible that the coin could be this or this so it's a distribution so that's our uh, probability of theta given the data which is what we are interested in knowing what kind of coin it is and uh, as per base rule it's directly proportional to two things uh, one is probability of data given theta, which is our likelihood, uh, right? And also the prior, which is the probability of theta, okay? All right. So this is, uh, in a way, our belief. And our belief can be updated based on the observations we see and the prior belief that we have. So the observations that we see, the probability of seeing a data given the nature of the coin, right? So that's the observation, the data that you see and the probability of theta. So probability of theta give, uh, d given theta and times probability of theta. But then what is in the denominator? Why do you need this probability of d? Yes, you guessed it, right? We are talking about probability and it has to uh, satisfy all the laws of probability. So obviously, uh, we cannot get to a number which is not within 0 and 1. So we need to normalize it with uh, probability of uh, seeing data. But then what is probability of data? Let's get to it in a second. So let's initially assume that uh, probability of theta is uniform. Uh, so we know nothing about the coin initially, let's say, right? So that's what I mean by this line. So there's nothing to calculate. So how do you calculate probability of uh, d given theta? So probability of theta is uh, constant, okay? So I'm trying to get the numerators. So, so in a real scenario, let's assume that this is a constant. Now we want to know probability of d given theta. 
<clears throat> now how can you compute probability of d given theta jacob bernoulli comes over here uh, for the rescue so he says that uh, um, you could compute it simply with uh, theta raised to the power z and 1 minus theta power n minus z this must be very familiar to you from school mathematics if d observed is triple h double d so i did five coin tosses and the data that i observed is uh, uh, head 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 and tail tail then uh, theta is 0.5 Right. So we have a probability of d given theta is simply um, 0.5 appeared three times. That's head appeared three times, 0.5 into 0.5 into 0.5. And tail appeared twice. That's 1 minus 0.5, which is 0.5 again, appeared 5 minus three times, which is two times. Right. So this is the probability of seeing this data given that uh, you had a fair coin. But let's say you did not have a fair coin. Uh, then uh, your probability of theta would have a different uh, value and for each value of theta you will get a different probability of d given theta and you can still get a distribution of probability of d given theta okay uh, so you have to remember two things here one we are interested in the distribution and not specific values so all these are actually giving you different different distributions assuming different values of theta even for uh, theta being a constant or probability of theta being a uniform distribution uh, the theta value is same for different values uh, uh, right so uh, uh, so, so we are pro plotting the probabilities right so probability of seeing a da data specific data like this given theta will still be a distribution skewed towards uh, some side and uh, in this way of formulation, you might have already noticed the order of H and T's don't matter. It's only the count of H and T's uh, that matter. So calculate uh, probability of D given theta for the observation double T triple H and theta is 0.3. So let's say my uniform distribution is no more there. And uh, now I have a theta distribution, which is uh, skewed towards 0.3 towards the tail, right? So if I have like that, then what happens to probability of d given theta? Simply probability of d given theta is 0.3 uh, thrice uh, uh, h h h and uh, then uh, 0.7 twice. So okay, in this case, uh, 0.3 refers to the probability of getting a head um, and then 0.7 uh, is the probability of getting tail and we saw two tails, so 0.7 square. And this gives me 0 0.013. So that's how I compute the numerator, right? So, so I have a probability of d given theta and I have probability of theta. But uh, how do I compute the probability of seeing all possible data? Okay. Well, probability of d can be expanded. Uh, uh, in a discrete uh, uh, scenario, it is simply probability of d given thetas, all possible thetas times probability of theta, the prior there. So this is simply probability of D, right? So again, this follows from our basic understanding of conditional probabilities. And in the continuous distribution world, we would replace the summation with an integral and achieve the same result. Okay, so that's all there is. So if you are plotting for three values of theta, then you just sum up all that sum of, uh, for all those, three values uh, this denominator which will give you the probability of d so now i hope you understand how to compute uh, probability of uh, probability of d given probability of uh, theta given d um, uh, so we we know how to compute all these things so we can so if you keep giving me if you have if you share with me some prior probability and if you keep giving me the observations i can keep updating my beliefs using uh, this Bayesian uh, approach, a Bayesian rule. Okay, so we figured out a way. So intuitively, it looks like this. So let's say my prior is weak. I don't know anything about uh, the coin. Any value of the coin is equally likely. And then I see one data. The moment I see one data, now my belief gets skewed. Now it's no more. Uh, so initially, my belief is same as my prior. But after seeing the data, my belief gets updated and it looks like this. Um, oh, sorry, this is the data that I have seen. So it's, it's one data which says the likelihood of what the coin nature could be. 
now i take this uh, likelihood and apply it on this prior and i get a posterior so posterior or this base rule has the effect of uh, dragging the prior towards the likelihood um, and we get a posterior of this sort this is just for illustrative understanding so we can compute probability of theta given theta uh, given data given uh, these two values the prior and the likelihood okay um, to compute this we have to compute this painful denominator that's a lot of work to do uh, but uh, continuous uh, but but uh, um, there is something which comes to our rescue look at this beautiful stuff which is up ahead so we have studied about forms and function every form has a function and every function should have a form right um, so look at uh, these uh, forms um, so these must be normal to you the bell curves the normal form right and uh, they have a function uh, and uh, we know that uh, normal uh, function has this kind of uh, normal form has this kind of a function okay so uh, there are many distributions and each distribution has a different form and a different uh, function okay but we are interested in this kind of a form right a form where a prior could be a uniform or prior could be skewed and a posterior could be skewed uh, just like the likelihood so we are interested in finding a function which has this kind of a uh, form theta distribution just does exactly that what we are looking at um, so we have uh, uh, this uh, as the function uh, if this looks complicated don't worry i felt the same when i came across for the first time uh, we are not getting into the details of the gamma functions and uh, distribution but uh, uh, let me show you um, how nice all these things fits into our model. By the way, this is uh, Vadim Elvi, a famous Tamil comedian, and this is one of his great expressions of being terrified and confused. Uh, when I show this uh, chart to my students and say, here is the beta distribution, usually this is the reaction I get from them. Okay, uh, fun apart, let's get back to uh, the beta distribution. So let's take two parameters A and B. And let's assume A is number of times I see H plus 1 and B is number of times uh, I get T plus 1. This is just to avoid the 0, 0 case. Um, uh, you may ignore uh, the plus 1s for a large uh, value uh, of uh, A and B. So after 10 flips, uh, we may end up in one of uh, these three. So beta of 2, 8 gives you this. So if you have R, uh, this is a function in R, you could simply chart beta of A, comma B. And you will get that beta of 2, 8 is this chart. Beta of 5, comma 5 is a nice chart centered at the, uh, you know, in the middle. And uh, 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 and then, or peaking at the middle, I should say. Uh, and we have a beta of 8, comma 2 skewed towards the right end. So this is exactly what we want, right? So if the coin, uh, if you toss and if you see eight heads, then the coin should be skewed towards the head. Uh, then, and uh, if I get two heads, then uh, my belief should be skewed towards the tail. Uh, and these are the exact graphs uh, that I get when I chart beta of uh, two comma eight, five comma five, or eight comma two. There's one more thing. If I have uh, 11 comma 11, so that means uh, out of 22 tosses, 11 heads and 11 tails, then I have some belief that uh, this coin is a fair coin. But if I did 32 tosses and get 16 head and 16 tail, then that belief becomes even stronger that it's a fair coin, right? Now, how do you say you have a stronger belief that it's a fair coin? The curve just becomes uh, uh, taller and steeper, right? So, uh, so that's uh, and that's exactly what happens when you chart beta of 16 comma 16 and beta of 11 comma 11. What should happen for uh, beta of 1 comma 1? Take a moment, pause and think. Yes, you're right. Uh, beta of 1 comma 1 basically means you have not done any experiments, you have not seen the coin, so you don't know anything about the coin and it should be a uniform distribution, right? A very weak prior. You don't know anything. So that's exactly what we get for beta of 1 comma 1. Isn't this beautiful? Looks like a uh, beta function was uh, invented just for this purpose, uh, but it, it seems to fit that well uh, to this situation. Okay, so what do we need to do is pretty simple. If I have a prior beta of a comma b and if I do z 
uh, if I do n trials and get z heads, then I simply have to to get the posterior. I have to do beta of a plus z and beta of uh, beta of a plus z comma b plus n minus z. So number of heads and number of tails need to be added. That's all. So remember the last uh, Bayesian rule with all the integral and the summations and multiplications and all that. So now suddenly uh, it seems like a, a simple change of parameters to beta and I got what I wanted. You know? uh, so these kind of um, uh, models where we have uh, posterior, uh, uh, you know, where we can derive posterior from a prior, um, uh, you know, so like this are called conjugate priors, you know, such priors that have the same form, uh, the, where the posterior and the prior have the same form, right? So they are called uh, conjugate uh, priors, just uh, some technical detail over here. Okay, so let me summarize. Um, uh, the prior refers to my initial belief on the coin that I have. The likelihood is uh, what the data indicates. Posterior is, um, you know, when I have the prior and the likelihood, how I change my belief. So that's my posterior. Uh, Bayes rule helped me find the posterior from the prior and the likelihood. We also saw that uh, part of, I mean, this computing the likelihood uh, can be done using Bernoulli's uh, uh, idea. And then we also saw a beta distribution where um, the entire form fits so beautifully to this problem. Uh, that I could uh, I could use this uh, uh, beta distribution to model the entire stuff and find the posterior by simply adding the number of heads and tails to the parameters. Hope that was uh, um, that was easy and interesting for you to follow. Um, if you want to read more, uh, I suggest uh, the book on the on doing Bayesian data analysis by John uh, Kruske. And there are also uh, nice YouTube videos uh, from Brandon Folds on uh, Statistics 101, uh, especially the binomial distribution one is the, is the video that you should see to understand how um, we put the Bernoulli's ideas to work. Okay, so with that, uh, we move on uh, uh, with one last preparatory slide and then I promise I'll get into probabilistic retrieval. The maximum likelihood estimation. So let's say I give you an observation double H, double T, double T, double H, uh, double T, double T, double T, double T, right? So this is some observation that I give, give to you and I ask you what values of probability of H and probability of T will maximize uh, the probability of the above observation, okay? Uh, so what is the probability of getting a head? What is the probability of getting a tail? Um, and give me those values that will maximize this or uh, that will you know uh, maximize seeing this observation. So probability of seeing this observation uh, we have already seen is simply um, if uh, h is uh, uh, x let's say probability of h is x let's say so x raised to the power 4 times 1 minus x raised to the power 12. So there are 16 observations there. 16 head and tail values there in our observation. So for what value of x will this function maximize? You already know the trick. Uh, differentiate uh, uh, with respect to x and equate it to 0 and, uh, and see what happens, right? So this is one way to compute uh, p of h and p of t. We call this the maximum likelihood estimation. Okay, so let's move on. At last, we are into the topic of probabilistic retrieval. So let's say I have an information need Taj Mahal and let a query Q be Taj. Uh, let the results uh, be three documents. D1 has Taj, D2 has Taj Mahal and D3 has Taj T. And uh, let's say we had two judges uh, to give us relevance judgments and uh, judge one felt Taj is relevant but uh, uh, Taj and Taj Mahal are relevant, but Taj T is not relevant. And Judge 2 felt only Taj Mahal is relevant. Okay, so in this setting, let's uh, learn a few things. Now, documents can have probability of being relevant and of being non-relevant at the same time, right? Uh, for example, uh, in our document collection, uh, probability uh, of relevance being zero, given a document and a query, can be computed. Okay, uh, so I 
I take in this example 0 as being non-relevant and 1 being relevant. So when I say r equals 0, what is the probability that something is non-relevant, right? So the document is non-relevant given the document and the query is what we are. So, so we have the document which is touch and we also have the query. The query is also touch, right? So I have the query, I have the document D1. Um, so probability of R equal to zero given D1 and query equal to touch. Uh, and that is 0.5, why 0.5? Because the first judge said it's relevant, the second judge said it's non-relevant. So I associate a probability to this document for this query as 0.5. So can you compute uh, the probability of relevance R being zero for the given document, let's say Taj Mahal D2 uh, and the query Taj, what would that be? Yes. So if you go ahead and uh, compute this, you should get uh, this table, right? So the point here is that the documents can have probability of being relevant and uh, it, it has some probability of being non-relevant as well. So this is what we call as the probability of relevance. We use a probability ranking principle. Um, the idea here is that uh, when we retrieve documents, we want to rank documents by the probability of relevance. So take all uh, the values of probability of R equals one for Q comma D from this table and sort your results by this value. And that whatever you get is what you want to return. Um, so, so this is our principle, the rank you know, to, to rank documents by the probability of relevance. So in this uh, case, using the probability ranking principle, my search result would be Taj Mahal first, <laughs> that has the highest value, and uh, Taj then, which is 0.5, and finally Taj T. We could also use Bayes optimal decision rule, and Bayes optimal decision rule says that D is relevant if probability of relevance is greater than probability of non-relevance. Okay, so a slight deviation from the prior idea where we simply ranked by the probability of relevance. Now we are comparing probability of relevance with the probability of non-relevance and seeing if the probability of relevance is greater, then I return. So in this case, I return only Taj Mahal because in, in this, this is the only case where probability of relevance is greater than probability of non-relevance. Here they are equal and here it is less up. So Taj Mahal comes out as the answer. Predicting relevance. Um, so the so far we have used the user given relevance. So there was a judge who said that this is relevant, this is not relevant. So we got to these values, right? 0 0.5, 1, and so on. Now the question is: can we predict it? Uh, can we estimate or can we predict the relevance based on term occurrences in the document? Okay. Um, so you may assume query and document as a set of uh, words and you, we'll, you, we can use a labeled set from judges or mind data from click logs to come up with this kind of an estimate. Okay, so let's say a user gave uh, some rating of relevance and uh, I have a query with some words and I have a document with some other words, right? Or maybe some words from the query as well. So I have the query, I have the document, and I have the relevance. Uh, now, uh, I have a limited number of user judgments. And from this, I want to come up with a model which will predict, given a query, the value for relevance. OK, that's what I want to learn. I can use the binary independence model here. Uh, let me introduce this for you. Uh, so each document is a binary vector of terms, whether a term occurs or a term doesn't occur. We already have seen this in our vector space model. Please go back to that video if you haven't seen that already. Uh, so occurrence of terms uh, is mutually independent is another assumption that we take over here. In, in this uh, kind of a situation, I can apply a binary independence model where I simply say that probability of uh, relevance equals one given data uh, and the query or probability of a document D being relevant to query Q, right? So that's what, that's how I read this, is a belief, right? So, and that belief um, depends on my observation and my prior belief. My observation is probability of D given it's relevant uh, to a query times probability of relevance <coughs> given uh, a query, right? So this is the prior uh, belief, probability of relevance given a query over 
probability of d given q. So this is simply uh, base rule applied on uh, this conditional probability that I have. We'll not get into the details of the conditional probability. Please rewind and go back to the initial parts of this video to understand some basics of conditional probability and go to the references uh, to learn more about conditional probabilities. But um, I assume that you understand uh, this formulation pretty well. Let's, let me show you some example to uh, help you uh, get the intuitions. So let's say I am interested in estimating the probability of relevance given document and Q. Uh, so this is the formula for your reference uh, and now let's go back to our original example uh, of Taj, Taj Mahal and Taj T uh, and so uh, and the query is uh, Taj let's assume okay so for uh, uh, so can you compute the probability of D equals Taj the document is Taj given um, that it is relevant and uh, given the query right so given the query is Taj what would that be so to compute uh, so, so you, you need to compute this, which is the first part of this uh, base rule. And you also need to compute the second part, which is probability of uh, uh, relevance uh, given the query. And you also need to compute the denominator, which is probability of D given Q. Right? So if you have all these three values, then you could compute the belief probability of relevance given document and Q. Now, how do I compute each of these parts? I suggest you pass the video on the previous slide uh, and then come and see the solution once. Uh, uh, okay, so if you have already done this, let's go ahead and try to compute the stuff. Okay, so I have uh, only three documents, Taj, Taj T and Taj Mahal, right? Okay, so we have only these uh, three documents and we have only two possible values of relevance here, R equals zero and R equals one. That's um, um, that's the way we have modeled relevance, right? Either something is relevant or something is not relevant. Okay. Now, given uh, a query Q, which is uh, Taj, I have um, the document D1 um, being either relevant or non-relevant. So 0.5 and 0.5, right? So it could, it's, it's on, it's in the middle. It could be relevant, it could be non-relevant with equal probability. So 0.5 here and 0.5 there. I have Taj Mahal, uh, which uh, is, uh, which has zero probability, which, which has uh, P of R equals zero given D comma Q as zero, right? So, so that is totally on one side and Taj Mahal is totally on the other side. Right. And um, uh, okay, so now this is what I have and I can draw uh, an Euler diagram like this given uh, this data. Okay. Um, now I have only three documents. Um, so to complete the Euler diagram, I need to assign the probability values uh, for the universe. So the, the universal probability has to be one. Uh, so I have to distribute it across three documents. So one by three, one by three, one by three. And within that one by three, uh, I have to distribute. Uh, uh, so I told you that half is on this side, which is R equals zero and half is on the other side where R equals one. So I have to associate one over six and one over six, right? So that's how I got this uh, diagram. Once I have this diagram, I can compute probability of R equals one given D equals touch and query Q. Um, which should come to half. And this is what we revised in the conditional probability part of this lecture. I hope you understood this. If not, please go back and uh, uh, strengthen your understanding of conditional probabilities. Okay, um, now let's talk about the odds of relevance, which is a lot easier to calculate. Why is it a lot easier to calculate? Because we are only interested in probability of relevance equals one over probability of relevance, e relevance not equal to one, which is relevance equal to zero. Now, when I do this, uh, you see that the beauty is the denominator goes away, right? So they have the common denominator, they go, they go away, and I only need to compute the numerators and uh, I'm done, right? So these cancel each other, uh, the denominators cancel each other. Right, uh, so that is what uh, the odds are. Um, so basically, um, uh, if we are interested in, uh, uh, so I, I, I am after canceling these, uh, I have these this by this the probability of relevance equals one by relevance equals zero equals 
um, the numerator of this over the numerator of uh, this. Okay. Okay. That is uh, what I have got uh, from this. I can estimate the probability of a particular document by simply rearranging the equation as I have shown here. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, in our binary independence model, we assume that the term occurrence is mutually independent. Uh, so since uh, the term occurrence is mutually independent, so uh, okay, one more thing here is that uh, just for convenience, I have uh, written this entire numerator as this. Okay, so there's no magic happening over here. Uh, I'm just uh, writing it uh, like that. Okay. Okay. So I hope uh, everything is clear to you. So this is the LHS, which equals this RHS, and this can be simplified, and this is what would result. Now let's go to um, uh, our uh, mutually independence assumption. If uh, the terms in my document uh, right, are mutually independent, I can break this part, uh, which is probability of uh, the document X, uh, which is a vector of terms, um, uh, you know, as a product of uh, probability of Xt given r equal to 1 comma q, right? Uh, and assuming there are m terms, uh, I just have to multiply it m times, right? So that's why the product uh, comes over here. So I can write this as this. So this simply says, uh, you know, the term occurrence, right? Uh, so if you take the probability of term occurrence for each term and if you multiply it and get uh, the relevance. So I have uh, this, which can be written uh, as this here. Um, so each term uh, either can be relevant or uh, uh, or uh, yeah, uh, can be each term can be existent or can be non-existent, right? So xt uh, can either have a zero or a one in our vector. So I can split this further uh, into uh, xt equals zero case and xt equals uh, one case for each term, right? Um, okay. So once I have done this, so let's assume this entire thing is pt. Then this would be one minus. Pt because it, everything is same except that this is xt equals 1 and this is xt equals 0. Uh, the term occurrence value in our vector uh, that could be 0 or 1. right? So, uh, so if this is uh, Pt, uh, then this must be 1 minus uh, Pt. And similarly, if this is Ut, then this is 1 minus Ut. So thus, we come uh, with a formulation such as uh, this. And here, you notice that uh, uh, this is if uh, so i have conveniently uh, split this in such a way that uh, um, for a you know so we only care for these um, uh, for only those terms that are in the query right so 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 we are interested in only those t's such that qt equals 1 meaning that term exists in the query okay and then that term exists in the documents where xt equals 1 and uh, that term doesn't exist uh, in the document xt equals 0. We don't care for the rest of the terms which are not in the query. So I can uh, rewrite the uh, same thing as here, right? It's it's the same thing with the, uh, the introduction of the query terms. That's all. Okay, so this is what we are interested in computing. Now you can see that uh, the first part is simply a constant term uh, and we are only interested in ranking so we can uh, conveniently eliminate uh, the constant terms um, so so that is so that is why just computing this by this uh, is sufficient and this by this ends up here okay so this is what uh, we want to compute and uh, you can again see that uh, the second part is actually not document specific at all and it is constant for any query okay so this part is not document specific and it is constant for any query so again that part can be removed we don't need to worry about and the remaining thing is called the retrieval status value 
which is uh, the product of uh, pt times 1 minus ut and ut times uh, 1 minus uh, pt so this is a simple rearrangement of the uh, prior equation yeah so once we have done that uh, this rsv is used uh, for ranking uh, the documents if the last part was slightly heavy and quick for you uh, please go back and uh, understand the base rule and the conditional probability a little uh, deeply uh, get a little bit of aptitude there and then come back uh, and then these equations should uh, seem obvious to you after that so that's all there is uh, for today on probabilistic retrieval um, uh, this was another beautiful way of modeling a retrieval system just like how we model using a vector space model yeah so this uh, this is why probabilistic, probabilistic retrieval is, uh, is is brilliant uh, and very nice to study okay so let's stop here thank you